Welcome to the Philosophy of Science lecture. Today we start with the third part of the lecture entitled Law Hypothesis and Their Testing. Uh, three things I have to mention in advance. Um, so first, this is about so to speak empirical law hypothesis. Um, with that I just mean that each uh, non-logical concept or variable of the hypothesis um, can be empirically observed or measured independently from any uh, theories uh, which are at the same time tested. So, so um, whether a, a certain uh, uh, predicate mentioned in the hypothesis applies to a particular individual or not can be, can be measured independently of assuming that the law hypothesis is true or false, right? So in this sense, uh, they are empirical. This is different when the law hypothesis contains theoretical concepts or latent variables which cannot be directly measured independently from the assumption of, of the law or from the assumption of some background theory which has to be, which is not taken for granted but which is also tested at the same time. So this more complicated situation will be handled and dealt with in this lecture in the last, in the fourth part. Now, in this third part, I deal with empirical law hypotheses and how we can test them. Okay. The second point, in order to be simple, I will deal here with uh, qualitative law hypothesis. So we have qualitative variables uh, or discrete variables, uh, qualitative concept, but not necessarily quantitative concepts. Um, this uh, is... Uh, held in, in, in other disciplines under the rubric of curve fitting, etc. Now here I deal with basically with the basic stuff of uh, testing a qualitative law hypothesis. The third point is I will handle the two cases in parallel. Strict laws on the one hand side, on the one side, and statistical laws on the other side. And Usually, if, if you look at test books in statistics and in philosophy of science, strict laws, <coughs> universal strict laws, and statistical correlations are um, not treated in parallel. So you don't really see what is common to, to both and what is common to the procedure of confirmation or for weakening of, of statistical and strict laws and I will focus on, 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 on the common ground here so I will do first strict laws and then statistical laws but um, I will do the, them both in parallel and try to show what is, what is common and also what is different. Okay, so my for, first point is this, when we test um, an empirical law hypothesis, or a law hypothesis in general, where the concepts can be, or the variables can be measured, um, then it's not only the truth of the law hypothesis which we are after, we are also asking, always asking whether the law hypothesis is relevant, or whether the factors mentioned in it are relevant whether there is really a dependence <coughs> reflected by the law. So you will see what I mean with that. Let me first turn to the deterministic case or also the strict case as, as we call it as the first, as the first uh, case. So um, consider laws of the following form for all x if x has the property a1 and a2, then x has the property c. This is the formula here. So the antecedent condition a consists of a conjunction of two factors, a1 and a2, and the consequent predicate consists just of one property c. And we want to test that such a law is true and relevant, now I want to demonstrate the notion of relevance here. Consider the following law. All men 
who take birth control pills do not get pregnant. Um, so, what do you say? What, is it this law? What is, what is going wrong with this law? Is it false? Answer? Any answer? No. No, but what, what is wrong with this law? The fact that the men take birth control pills isn't really relevant to the fact that they don't get pregnant. Exactly. So, here you see what I mean. So the fact that this, the factor, the antecedent factor of taking birth control pills is not relevant for not getting pregnant in case of men, because men never get pregnant whether they take birth control pills or not. So this is what I mean with what is meant with relevance. By the way, the example, this example comes from a philosopher of science called Wesley Salmon and he wrote a lot about the condition of relevance for scientific law hypothesis. In other domains in science, like in, <coughs> uh, in statistics, one speaks of dependence. So one also says there is no dependence between getting pregnant and taking birth control pill in the population of men. Just in the population of women, they are dependent, right? But anyhow, when we test a law hypothesis, we are not only after the truth of them, but we all, we all want to know which factors whether we want to, to assure that indeed all factors which we mention in the law are relevant to the consequent or the consequent depends on all and if they are irrelevant we leave them out right because irrelevant factors are predictively irrelevant and irrelevant factors are also causally irrelevant right so if you want to know the causes we have to take, leave out all irrelevant factors so this is a condition here. It's interesting that <coughs> the search, the test for dependency relations um, is also something which is typical for science as opposed to pre-science scientific worldviews. Um, for instance, consider this uh, thing here. This is an, uh, an old uh, instruction rule of um, of uh, 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 old witchcraft magics, right? So, uh, witches' ointments in the Middle Ages, right, in the medieval uh, era, uh, um, had deadly nightshade in it, and the instruction was if deadly nightshade is picked at midnight during full moon, then it develops it hallucinogenic then it has its hallucinative powers, right? So, you know, deadly nightshade, if you take too much, it's really deadly, but it's a drug and it causes like LSD, these hallucinations and these streams and like, which is flying on their bruise and so on, right? Um, and so, um, uh, and, and you find these uh, uh, in, in uh, Handbooks of uh, 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 writings of, of magic, uh, witch, witchcraft magic, and similar, right? In many uh, instructions which you which you have in natural medicine or in natural basic medicine um, of earlier times, they contain some empirical tools, like, but uh, I mean they contain a lot. They uh, mention a lot of irrelevant factors which are never tested. That, uh, so this this is just tradition. Uh, you, you, <coughs> your grandma, which, which grandma tells you, pig it at night, midnight, tell a nightshade and, and uh, uh, rub your body with it and you will have these dreams and it works so good. But you don't test whether really the, the picking at midnight is, is, a, is a relevant factor. That, that you really test, start to test this, right? You systematically vary and you, you ask, well maybe I, I pick nightshade at daytime and it works in the same way. This is a typical scientific question. This is typical for scientific experimentation to ask these kinds of questions. What happens if I, if I vary the antecedent conditions? 
Um, and um, this is uh, also uh, uh, one reason of the power of, 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 of scientific experimentation, that you really, by varying these conditions, by varying the antecedent factors, um, you find out where, so, where are the two uh, dependencies in nature, right? Which factors are, are really dependent on each other. And by this you find ultimately then out what are the causes, right? Okay. So let us now try to formalize the condition of relevance for strict laws. <coughs> we can say that um, in such a uh, law of the form, if x is an a1 and an a2, then x is a c, we say that a factor a1 is relevant for the consequent a property c, a1, and the seed factor a1 is relevant for c, if and only if, this if, this double f means if and only if, it is not already true that for all x, if they have property A2 without having A1, right, then they have the consequent property C. So then A1 is relevant. So in other words, in such a law, a factor, an antecedent factor A1 is relevant if, if you leave it out, right, the law breaks down, right? But if you leave that factor out, if you cross it out, if you cancel it, the law still holds. So the regularity holds without the antecedent factor, then it's irrelevant. Then C is not dependent on A1. And in the strict case, this means that it's not true that already all A2s are Cs, right? A1 is, is, is so to speak, necessary for the consequent. So, this notion of relevance or dependence can also be expressed in terms of the notion of relative necessity, so to speak. And if you express it in that way, you have this condition, A1 in, in the law of this kind is relevant for the consequent factor C, the consequent predicate C. If A1 uh, is a necessary conjunctive part of a sufficient antecedent condition or cause, cause, it need not be a cause, right, of a su sufficient antecedent condition, which usually is also a cause, of C. So A1 must be a necessary condition of a sufficient, of the sufficient con uh, uh, antecedent condition A, right. And uh, the formulation in terms of necessary parts of sufficient conditions, right, is due to a philosopher called John Mackey. John Mackey had a, a little bit stronger notion. He spoke of a necessary but insufficient part of a sufficient but unnecessary condition. This is his famous Einus theory, but I don't speak about that here too much or too long. What is also important for us to note is relevance in this sense this kind of relevance here is a necessary condition for causal, for causality. So the antecedent factor being one cause of the consequent factor, <clears throat> this can only be the case if A1 is also a relevant antecedent factor for C. But relevant alone, relevance alone is not sufficient for causality. So it's not uh, it's not uh, the case that whenever we have a true and fully relevant implication law of this form, then A1 and A2 are automatically also causes of C. What only holds is if, the, if A1 is irrelevant, or in that case A2 is irrelevant, then it cannot be a cause, right? But causality is stronger than predictive relevance, right? Causality is, is, is still stronger, and in which sense it is even stronger than that, um, I will speak about in, in two lectures from this. I will tell you about, about the specific, in which sense causality is still stronger than relevance. Causal relevance is still stronger than predictive relevance. But the first step, so to speak, to eliminate the non-causally, the causally irrelevant factors is to look for irrelevances in exactly this sense. And that is what also John Mackey was about. Okay. So, now I turn to the statistical case. In the statistical case, what is a, 
right uh, formulation of the relevance assumption or the relevance condition here. Let's take a statistical loss. Now we assume a simple form, 95% of all A's are C's. Or the probability of C given A is 0 0.95. Is 0 .95. So my example is this one. 95% of all persons having a cold who regularly take high doses of vitamin C, this is antecedent condition, taking uh, high doses of vitamins, vitamin C, make a full recovery within one week. This is a consequent predicate, right? And the population in our case is now the domain of persons having a cold. So 90% of them taking vitamin C make a full recovery. Again, this example is again has uh, again be uh, stated by and given us by Selman in his uh, uh, book on statistical relevance. And he mentioned that in the 1950s there was a debate in the, I think in the New York Times about uh, the effectiveness of vitamin C because people found out that 90% of all persons having a cold recover within a week anyhow, anyway, whether they take uh, vitamin C or not, right? So it was, uh, this means, this finding means that A is, uh, that A is irrelevant, right? for C, because the probability of, in that case, it means, what does it mean? It means that the, it's irrelevant because the probability of C recovering this one week, given you take vitamin A, vitamin C, this is A, is the same as the probability of recovering within one week, anyhow, within the uh, population of people having a cold, right? So A is statistically relevant uh, in that case. That is meant with statistical relevance, right? Well, just to mention that there was a debate ongoing in the New York Times about this effectiveness of vitamin C and there were replication studies and ongoing studies and then later on people found out uh, that uh, vitamin C has a prophylactic value, it prevents, if you take, while you are not ill, you pre it prevents you from, from getting a cold, uh, of, uh, it reduces your frequency of getting a cold if you take vitamin C, but if you have already uh, getting the flu or whatever, then uh, taking vitamin C doesn't really speed up your recovery, right? So it ha just has, has a prophylactic, prophylactic um, uh, effect. That was then the outcome. But the discussion was triggered by this finding that this statistical law contains an irrelevance. Okay. So, um, how can we now generalize this? Okay, um, here's a condition. We say that a factor A, an antecedent factor A, is statistically relevant for a consequent predicate C if the probability of C given A is different from the probability of C, right? In, in, in statistics or, and in psychology, often this antecedent factor is called the predictor variable, right? And the consequent predicate is called the criterion variable, right? And you speak of variable, and if you have just simple properties like A and C, they are binary variables like A and not A or C and not C, right? So this is a notion of relevance. Likewise, the factor A is irrelevant for C if the probability of C given A is equal than the probability of C, right? You say that A is positively relevant for C if A raises C's probability, right? And A is negatively relevant for C if A lowers C's probability. The probability of C given A is smaller than that of C unconditionally. So these are the notions here. Now, you see this notion of relevance in statistics is intimately, intimately connected with the notion of correlation, which you hear very often. So the scientists found the correlation between A and B, or between X and Y. So how is that related? A simple correlation measure for binary properties is just 
this one, the difference. It's also called the difference measure, right? And uh, the correlation between A and C is just the difference between conditional probability of C given A and the unconditional probability of C. And then you can say A is positively relevant for C if the correlation between A and C is positive, right? It's negatively um, um, relevant for C if the correlation is negative and is irrelevant, A is irrelevant for C if the correlation is zero. So this is um, uh, simple, um, as simple as that. Let me also mention that um, irrelevancies uh, are very, as I told you, very important for the for the scientific progress with the, with the experimental method, but irrelevancies are often, a, so so to speak, they play also a role. For instance, in chokes, like often chokes are based on irrelevancies. So there's the choke of the LSD freak on the Trafalgar Square. He's always shouting and yelling around all, all time. Do you know that joke? And well, he shouts and yells around and waves his arms and all, all things like that. And the passenger goes by and asks him, what's, what's going on? Why, why are you doing this? Uh, and he says, well, uh, uh, I drive the tigers out. I keep the, the tigers out of that place, right? And then the passenger says, well, there are no tigers here in London. Well, and then, well, you see how good I do that, right? See how good I am in that. So that's uh, irrelevance, like, and, and, and a lot of <laughs> jokes of that sort are based on this irrelevance uh, because it's just funny. Like, like it's funny to say men who never take, uh, birth, who always take birth control pills, never get pregnant. I mean, if I tell you, well, I, I take them too because I don't want to get pregnant, you always will laugh. You, you, you will laugh about me, right? So that's okay. That's funny about irrelevance. Yeah. I think it's, this also relates to um, what you state as the goal of science to find true and contentful statements because the statement that all men don't get pregnant yeah. is uh, logically stronger, yes. more content than yes. the statement only men who take birth control get pregnant. Yeah, thank you for this remark. Exactly. The, the relevant statement is a strength singing. In the, in the strict case, the relevant statement is a strength singing of the irrelevant statement. That's true. In the statistical case, by the way, not, right? In the statistical case, because of the non-monotonicity, uh, if, if I tell you that the probability of C is high, so let's say, let's write it down in a better way, the probability of C in the domain D is high, and the and domain D is now the the domain of all people uh, 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 which have a cold, right? This is now a domain. Then if I tell you that the probability of uh, C given D and A is equal than the probability of C given D, so that's, this is an additional information, right? This is an additional information. Well, if, if I have a strict law, if all Ds are Cs, then I automatically know because of the monotonicity that all these which are A's are C's too. But here it need not be. Though if I add the, the factor A here, it could be that it gets, the probability gets, lo gets lowered by A. Right? This, you call this also the non-monotonicity of conditional probabilities. There is no, no clear relation. The probability if you add this factor could be higher, then this could be left equal or could be get lowered. So in the statistical case, the information that a factor is irrelevant is, is really not logically deducible from a stronger knowledge, but it's an independent fact which is important to be discovered. Right? So it's important not only to know the correlations, but also to know in statistics which factors are independent from what. Okay. This brings me a little bit to some information about for those uh, who have acquaintance with statistical methodology and the notion of correlation in statistics. Um, um, well, there are diff first of all, there are different measures. Uh, what I told you here, this is called the difference measure. This is called the difference measure. But there are, for instance, another correlation measure would be the so-called ratio me measure. By the way, this um, 
Uh, another measure is this measure, the con probability of the conjunction of C and A minus the probability of the product minus the product of the probability of C and that of A. This is called the covariance measure. And this is, has quite nice properties. So these are different quantitative measures of correlation. Um, they are, these uh, three measures are also um, often mentioned in the theory of confirmation as three different measures. Um, and then in statistics, you know, in statistics you treat, um, well, let me also say something. Um, in statistics uh, you also have what is called the effect strength. The so-called effect strength, which are often used, is often used in meta-analysis in statistics. This is related to the difference measure. Uh, basically, this is the difference measure divided through the standard dispersion. So if you divide the difference between these two probabilities by the so-called standard dispersion, you get what is called the effect strength in statistics. And then there are, there are certain measures in statistics, uh, the, the standard correlation measures in statistics are summations, are sums of correlations between values of variables. In statistics, for instance, you, you uh, speak of um, binary variables, A and not A, with the values of the va variable X are A and not A, right? But you may have also variables um, having several values, like uh, you remember my lecture on the measurement theory, for instance, the attribute color has the values red, green, blue, and so on. So that the values may be, so here you have the values A and not A, here you might have the values Y1, Y2, Y3, whatever. And um, what's going on in statistics is the following thing. Basically, the correlations are defined between the values of variables, right? So, for instance, there's a correlation between A and C, right? So C might be the, just the value, the value of the binary variable X, C, are C and not C, right? So, so these are the, uh, the, the correlation between the values of variables. Um, now assume A1 through AN are the values of the variable X, A, and C1 through CN so M are the var values of the variable XC, then what you do in statistics is you sum up the correlation between the values of, of the values, sorry, you sum up the correlations between the values of the two variables, right? You sum them up, right? And that, what you get that, that is a standard uh, correlation coefficient in statistics, when you sum this up. Um, and in order to prevent the sum get becoming zero, um, because correlations may be positive and negative, you square these differences. So you, you don't use, in statistics, you don't use the differences, but the squared differences, and sum them up, and what you get then is exactly, for case, for qualitative concepts, so-called phi, phi uh, or the so-called chi coefficient and for quantitative variables you get the product moment correlation the product moment correlation and that is the way how these simple difference measures of correlation between values of variables are connected to these correlation measures which you use in, in statistical handbooks and we, which you usually don't understand, right? Properly. But you see that in these correlation measures in statistics, you really sum up correlations between values of variables. And that is important to know because there are certain idealization assumptions made in statistical mythology which are not really um, looked through by users of statistics. For instance, in the, if you have quantitative variables, you assume also that the correlations are linear and what you measure is ultimately how densely the, the, the 
uh, measurement points between the two variables, say xc and xa, are lying around this linear curve. So, and you sum up these correlations here. But it might well be that you have a nonlinear uh, non dependency between two variables like that, right? For low x values, the correlation is positive, and for high x values, the correlation is negative, right? Um, and then the effect would be that the statistical correlation gives you correlation zero. But if you conditionalize on certain values, you get correlations. So, so in other words, if the, if the correlations, if the dependence between two va variables is nonlinear, right, it may happen that the summation of these correlations between the different values of the two variables compensates each other to zero, right? Like in that case. Right. So you have correlation between x and y is high, is positive. So this is the, the correlation uh, is uh, smaller zero. The correlation between x and y is low, is greater zero. But the total correlation between the two is zero. Okay. So this uh, underscores the point which I make, made before, that primarily the correlations are between values of variables. And, and, and if you sum them up as a statistic, you lose information. OK. Um, further remark, how, we, how can we generalize this notion of a correlation um, to statistical laws with more than one antecedent factor? Uh, this is written down here. We, in that case, we speak of so-called conditional correlation measures. So, consider the law hypothesis. R percent of all those x that are a1 and a2 are c's. So, the probability of, of, uh, of c given, given a1 and a2 is r, right? So, we say, um, A1 is positively relevant for C if the probability of C given A1 and A2 is greater than the probability of C given A2. So what you do is, is you again, uh, you leave out, you cancel A1 and see whether the probability is lowered if you cancel A1 in the full antecedent factor, right? So you, you leave A2 constant and you ask whether the whether the addition of A1 to the antecedent increases the probability of C, given A2, right? Then, then A1 is positively relevant for C within this law. The, the, and that reason you speak of a conditional correlation, conditional on A2. A1 is negatively relevant for C if the probability of C given A1 and A2 is smaller than C given A2, right? So given A2, A1 decreases the probability of C, and A1 is irrelevant for C if conditional on A2, adding A1 doesn't change the probability of C. Well, these are the notions. And the conditional correlation measure is such that if it takes a simple difference measure, which is a, the basic measure, I would say, uh, it's, it's just um, the probability of C given A1 and A2 minus the probability of C given A2. So this is conditional correlation. Again, there's a, a, an analogous notion in statistics which is called partial correlation. But in the so-called partial correlations, we again sum up conditional correlations for different values of A1, C, and A2, right? And therefore, again, the same can happen in this measure. If there are nonlinear correlations, then, then the partial correlation can be zero, but still there are conditional correlations for several so certain values or value ranges of the variables. Okay. S any questions so far? This was a little bit advanced stuff now. No? Yes? Uh, I have a minor remark. Yes? I think, uh, this is also relevant if you are interested in the demarcation problem. Okay. Since, uh, in pseudoscience, you can also often find irrelevant and serious factors. For example, uh, when a creationist speaks about God, you do not immediately see how it can raise or lower probability. 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, and informative what he says. Yeah, I will. I will speak about that. Uh, that uh, when when we uh, speak about testing statistical laws, uh, a, mist uh, a typical error in pseudoscience is that they don't test uh, for irrelevance uh, or for independence or for dependence. You have a lot of irrelevant factors. Actually, um, you will see soon. Um, uh, that uh, what is needed in order to test the law is a control group. As it's called, it's statistically you don't have control groups in pseudoscience, right? So I come to that now. So let me start. Now I turn to the topic testing of law hypothesis. And again, I start with strict law hypothesis or deterministic law hypothesis, as we call them. But then I will go on to statistical law hypothesis and and where, of course, the testing operation is, is a little bit more, is, is more complicated because you, there you have numbers to be tested and not simply yes or no's, all or nothings, um, or all or not all's. Um, but I will show what is common, so to speak, to the both, to the two. Okay, testing of strict law, uh, strict law hypothesis. Again, I assume a law a hypothesis of the form if x is an A1 and an A2, then x is a C, so A1 for all x, A1 and A2 implies C. Two antecedent factor conjuncts and one consequent property. And my example is now this one. For all chemical substances x, if x is solid and x gets heated, then x expands. Law from thermodynamics. So let's test it. The person, the philosopher who invented and formally, uh, let me let me say it better, who who developed the methodology of testing law hypotheses was John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill, the famous philosopher of science in the 19th century, or some centuries before, maybe in Francis Bacon, maybe even in, at the end of the Middle Ages in Roger Bacon and, and, and William von Ockham, there were, what you find, writings about the experimental method, but not fully described. The, the first full description of this method of testing is due to John Stuart Mill. And Mill called it <coughs> the method of agreement and difference. The methods of agreement and difference. So, here they are. When you test for truth of a law hypothesis, you use the method of agreement. And this goes as follows. You ask, is this law hypothesis true? Take an A sample. This is just a, a sample of individuals that, which satisfy the antecedent of the law. In our case, A1 and A2. So in our example, a sample of solid substances which you, exp which you uh, heat, right? In, in psychology, this is also called the experimental group. And then you ask, are all individuals in your A sample Cs? That's a method of agreement. Uh, do they all agree in regard to the consequent property, right? Well, if yes, the law is confirmed, right? So if all Solid substances in your sample expand after heating? Yes, the law is confirmed. If no, the law is falsified. So in that case, we again have this proper asymmetry. The law is not only weakened, it's definitely false. Because it's a universal law, and if you find at least one counterexample, it's proved to be false. Okay. Yeah, um, so this is uh, quite simple, and... Um, what would you say in the case of our law here, of our example, solid substances uh, expand when getting heated, is this true? Or do you know someone knows something about chemistry or so? It's universally true, would you would say? Um, <coughs> no, I think so. you're not a kid. You don't think so? I think it is. No, no, no it's, it's someone other opinion? No, no, it's, it's not true, right? There is a famous anomaly of water, right? You know, water, fro frozen water, so ice, when you heat it, right, decreases uh, 
in, in its volume between 0 and 4 degrees Celsius. I mean, if you heat ice, it melts, it decreases a lot. That's the reason why ice flows on water and doesn't sink, right? So that's a famous ano an anomaly of water. And if you look a little bit in chemistry, there are even some other substances which have some uh, anomalies uh, sh immediately after their mel melting point, right? Usually that happens. Um, then, in organic chemistry, there are certain substances which are rubber, rubber bands or something like that, which have macromolecules. On very different reasons here. If you hit them, the macromolecules change their form, get shorter, and then they are shortened. So that is also a kind of exceptions. So actually, it holds that most, <laughs> so it's almost true. So all solid substances expand when heated is almost true, or if, if you've, you could also apply um, the Lakatosian method of exception clauses and blah blah blah, the law, right, for x, blah blah blah, is true except for, except for water, syrup is 4 degrees, so you have then a list of exceptions, right, all these anomalies, so that's what you can read in chemistry books. So, so that's a typical practice of science. First you have strict laws and then you s collect some exceptions. And if you're lucky, the exceptions are, are manageable and are finite and then you still have something like a quasi-strict laws because you can reformulate the law and put it, the negation of the exception here in, in the antecedent as, as a very long addition in the antecedent condition and then you can save the strict form. Often you cannot, right? And then you have to turn to a statistical formulation. But here in that case, assume we, we can save the strict form somehow. And assume now we are just speaking about certain kind of substances. So assume now we can assume the law is true. So we restrict, say, to substances at least 30 degrees above their melting point, right? Um, right? Um, or at least a third of, of, of that different temperature difference between the melting and the boiling point, right? And we speak only about anorganic substances, then we can say the law is universally true. Let's assume it. Okay. So all solid substances of that class, when getting heated, expand. Good. So then our next question is testing for relevance. Are both antecedents factors really relevant? How do we test it? And here, the method of difference, what John Stuart Mill calls a method of difference, comes into play. What we do here is the following. So the question is, is A1 relevant for C? Is A2 relevant for C? And for strict laws, this question, of course, makes only sense if the law has already been confirmed to be true. If it's false, it doesn't make sense, because the question is now, does the law remain true if the factor A1 is cancelled? Yes. So we presuppose now that the law is true. So to test for it, we, t we take what I call a representative control sample. I didn't speak so far about representativeness. I will speak about that later on. Just first the notion of an A1 control sample. What is an A1 control sample? This is a sample of all of individuals which possess all antecedent factors except A1. This is an, this is an A1 control sample. So with, with an A1 control sample, uh, we test for the relevance of the factor A1. Right? In psychology, this is also called the control group, the control group in regard to the factor A1. And then we ask, are still all individuals in this A1 control sample C, right? If the answer is yes. So in, in the control sample where, where we have uh, individuals, all of them are not A's, not A1's, right? They don't have the property A1, they only have the property A2 in our case. But still all of them are C's, then the irrelevance of the factor A1 is confirmed. The irrelevance, 
the relevance of A1 is confirmed. A1 is not relevant. And it's only confirmed in that case because, well, you know, um, Uh, irrelevance, right, um, is, 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 is the assertion. Irrelevance means that another, another law, a stronger law holds. So I can only confirm that claim that a stronger law, ho law holds. Um, I might have, I might discover or observe in the future some further individuals uh, for which the implication between A2 and C breaks down, right? Uh, so. I can only confirm the irrelevance of A1, but cannot definitely verify it, right? Because the irrelevance of A1 is tantamount to asserting that for all x, if A2, then C, right? So I can only confirm that. So if all A2s in the A1 control samples are Cs, so all individuals in the A1 control samples are A2s, right? Then if they all are Cs, then A1 is confirmed as irrelevant. Now, on the other hand, if in the A1 control sample there are some individuals which are not Cs, then the impl strict uh, implication has bro broken down because we cancelled A1 in our control sample, right? And this means that A1 is relevant. And this even means it, uh, this even means that the relevance is now, conf uh, is now verified. It's verified because the relevance claim means that a certain universal implication does not hold, right? It just means that for all x, if A2, then C does not hold. And this can be definitely falsified. Relevance means that it is falsified. But it's only conditionally verified, the relevance, namely conditionally on the truth of the law hypothesis, mm, all A's are C's, right? Because relevance makes only sense if the if the law is true, if the full law is true. So I call this conditional verification here. Okay, so if all individuals in the A1 control sample are Cs, then the irrelevance of A1 is confirmed. If some individuals in the A1 control samples are not Cs, then A1 is proven to be relevant, conditional on the truth of the law. This is a method of difference. Okay. So what would you say in our example? What would be the outcome in our example? S solid substances, A A1 is solid, then they are heated, A2 is he being heated, then they expand. This is C. Which, which of the, in a, in a class where this law is true, which of the two factors is relevant and which is irrelevant? What would you say? What is relevant? Either is relevant, solid is irrelevant. Exactly. So this was very quick. So exactly, heating is relevant, but because if we have an A1, what would be an A2 control sample, uh, a, a, a sample of substances which are not heated, do they expand? No. I mean, the, if, if that would be relevant, uh, that would be irrelevant. Heating would be irrelevant. That would mean that all substances expand all the time, right? Which is nonsense. So obviously heating is relevant. Solid is relevant. Well, how do we test that? An A1 control sample would be a sample of substances which are what? Liquid. Liquid, for instance. Exactly. There are three aggregate states, solid, liquid, and gases. But obviously liquid substances expand when heated too. Except this anomaly of water between zero and four degrees Celsius, right? There's just, but for liquids, I think there's only this one exception, but maybe I'm in error. And for gases, it's really strictly universal. All gases expand when heating. There's no, there's no exception possible here. This is really strictly universal, being falling from the nature of a gas, the chemical nature. So being solid is not relevant, exactly. Very good, thank you. Good, so this is the outcome of our sample, of our example, sorry. Example. Now, the representative of samples, what does, of course, here we have an experimental sample, an antecedent, an A sample, here, and here we have this control sample. Both samples have to be representative. What does it mean? Well, First, uh, let's, let's speak about the sample for testing of truth, the A sample. What does it mean? 
it means you should m there should be a maximal variation of circumstances or of factors which are not mentioned in the antecedent and possibly possibly relevant not obviously not but maybe so if you want to confirm that solid substances heat um, expand when heated and you observe only metal one metal a second metal a third metal only metals well, that's not a good test. It's not a severe test in the sense of Popper, because, I mean, if there are exceptions, then these exceptions probably have a reason. You have already observed metals. If there are exceptions from the law, probably there is a qualitative factor responsible for that, but not, not, uh, not, among, not to be found among the metals. So you should also look uh, on, on minerals. Do they expand when heated? That's not so clear. I mean, a stone expands when heated, but only a very little bit. Right? You must really measure very precisely to see that, not as far as metal expands. And you should also maybe look on organ some organic substances. That's, it's not always the case, as, as we know, and so on. For strict generalizations, a representative sample is a sample where those factors which are not mentioned in this in the antecedent, but maybe of relevance, are really varied. And if the law is still robust, so the test of the law by the method of agreements really le leads to a positive confirmation result under maximally varied re remainder factors, then this is a severe test, right? This is a really severe test. Like in the, in the example which we use later on, if I want to test the hypothesis, the trees on freeways are, are sick, right? Then I, then I really don't test trees on freeways, which are in, in very urban areas, very close to factories where you have all kinds of emissions, right? Which may be the true cause of the sickness of trees, but you, but you look on, on trees in, 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 on all very different regions, right? All having just that property in common that they are close to freeways, right? But the main factors have to vary maximally. Okay. So this means representativity of samples in testing strict generalizations. So to say it maybe once again, a severe test uh, is a test where the chances of falsifying the, hypothe the hypothesis are high. So if there are exceptions of a hypothesis, these exceptions typically have a reason. They are exceptions because, they, because of a certain factor which so far is not mentioned or not considered in this antecedent. And in order to, to find these falsifying instances, if they are fair, we have to vary the remainder factors which are not mentioned in the sedents. That will, if there are exceptions, that will increase our chances to find them. Right? That is the reason for this representativity requirement. What this tells us also is, if you look at this method, in particular the method of difference, the importance of experiments. I have already mentioned that. The importance of experiments in order to find out the causal relations, the dependent relations in the world, to find out which events, uh, which, which were, were the reasons of certain events which we observe and which we maybe also want to manipulate by our actions. To find that out, we need the method of experiment. And a very nice example of that thought is the example of the discovery of purple feather, purple feather by Semmelweis. Let me tell you this story. Semmelweis um, was a physician um, in a hospital in the year 1845, and there were two delivery wards right, where, the, where the women came, women came in and delivered uh, their, their newborn babies. And uh, in the first delivery ward of Semmelweis, um, the rate of purple feather was unusually high, very high. And the second delivery ward, it was normal. So um, that was a pressing situation. And the first set of hypotheses <coughs> were hypotheses of the following form. They asked, um, well, maybe the poor standards of care are the reason, or the bad catering, maybe there's spoiled food or something which is the reason of, of the uh, uh, high battery favor rate in the first delivery ward. Um, but uh, these hypotheses were excluded by the method of excrement, 
disagreement, they were falsified because in the second delivery vote, these possible reasons were exactly the same as in the first delivery vote. In the second delivery vote, there was exactly the same standard of care and of catering and so on. So that couldn't be the reason because in the second delivery vote, there was no perpetual fever. So falsifi uh, disconfirmation or even falsification by the method of disagreement, uh, for, sorry, by the method of agreement, because we had disagreement, right? Similarly, the hypothesis that there could be a shortage of beds or whatever, or some people said meteorological influences, bad star constellations are the reasons. It couldn't be the case because they were exactly the same in the two delivery bots. Okay, so you see already here what, what, the, what was a lucky thing for Semmelweis, he had really a control group in the second delivery board, right? And uh, after a little bit of thinking, Semmelweis uh, had the, the natural idea, which is just the basic idea of the experimental method. Well, it must be a factor in which the first delivery board is different from the second. So now Semmelweis looked systematically for factors which are different in the two wards, in the two uh, departments of the hospital. And um, first, well, um, um, the first uh, factor which was taken into consideration was in the first delivery ward, most women gave birth in supine positions, so lying on the back, and the second delivery ward, they g were giving birth uh, lying on their sides. And that could be maybe a difference. So he ordered, do it in the same way as in the second delivery ward. So Samuel Weiss just now intervened, right? That is experimental method. That was, uh, that was exactly the operation now cancelling a one, right? Change it in the first delivery board. Do the uh, um, delivery exactly in the same way in the first ward as in the second ward. Effect um, that purple fever was still high after this change, though falsification by the method of uh, difference, right? Um, in, the, the, in the control group, the consequent uh, uh, the predicate was still present, so not a relevant factor. So this was not a relevant factor, the way how the delivery was uh, on the side or on, on the back. Then uh, the second thing, well, <laughs> the priests came to the second delivery ward much more often and earlier than the first delivery ward and the Catholic Church recommended to change this and Samuel Weiss didn't quarrel with them and said, well, well, I mean, well, let's change it, let's test it out and they tested that out. The priest came to the first delivery ward uh, early and very often and no, no effect. Finally, Samuel Weiss had the crucial idea. One, another difference was the following. In the first ward, medical students took part in the deliveries um, uh, the, so they helped the doctors in delivering the babies and uh, these students had previously been in the autopsy room, right? Where, uh, where they dissected um, dead bodies and so on. And of course, I mean, they washed their hands with soap, but the idea was maybe there's still some, some materials of the bodies on their hands and maybe there's, this is the cause. And Semmelweis taught them, well, change this factor, again experimental method, uh, wash your hands uh, um, uh, in chlorinated lime, which is a quite aggressive chemical in chlorinated lime, and they did it and immediately the purple fever rate went down to almost zero in the first delivery board. This means now we have an A1 and an A control group, right? The, the factor was changed, so factor was eliminated, they didn't no longer had these materials of the dead bodies in their hands. And the effect didn't occur, so confirmation by the method of difference, this is a relevant factor. And in that way, Semmelweis discovered uh, an important thing, namely um, the cause of, of infection uh, uh, and uh, the, the infectious substances as the cause of, of illnesses, right? And the, and the cause of diseases. And this was very important for the development of the theory of infection in medicine in general.
Okay, so this is a famous example of the discovery of purple fever by Semmelweis as an instantiation of the method of agreement and of difference. Any questions here? Yeah? Um, uh, Semmelweis, of course, is using a lot of background knowledge and ingenuity to, 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 make some, to formulate hypotheses about what kind of factors can make a difference. He doesn't consider things like, uh, oh, one of the words is farther west than the other one. Uh, other things that presumably, but based on background knowledge, you rule out as being causally irrelevant. Yeah? Is that, is there a reason here? Is this an objection or what? Uh, that's not an objection. Yeah. yeah, sure. He had background knowledge, but it was not known at the time that bacteria are the reason for infections or some invisible small organic, uh, uh, organic one cellular organisms like bacteria. That was not known at the time. And, and that, that uh, bacteria are on dead bodies and they are the reason for infections. Uh, was discovered uh, in this century and one reason for the discovery was Semmelweis discovery that material from dead bodies can cause infections and, and you know at the same time Schleiden and others uh, or some th when, 10 years or earlier something like that in the same century they discovered uh, one unicellular organisms but that these that certain unicellular organisms, certain bacteria, are the cause of infection. That was not known. That was very important. Right? Maybe a, a kind of related question. So, suggest that you should take a representative uh, control sample, and then you give a definition, of, or you give a proposal about what representativity, representativity consists in. That seems to be a limit concept that, of course, in, it's not really possible in practice, or maybe not even in principle, to go for a maximal. Uh, variation of circumstances. Yes, maximal, so as, so as, as far as, 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 as possible. I mean, vary them as, as good as you can. Course, That's the instruction, you, you, right? You use, you use ingenuity to sort of, what to, you can't go maximal, but you can, you, can, uh, you can use background knowledge to think about what kind of, what kind of variations are likely to be relevant. And, and, and yes, but I mean, the important, yeah, but uh, you know, the importance, in my view, as an empiricistically, somehow mildly empiricistically oriented philosopher of science, the importance of this method is to work quite independently from background knowledge. If you have it, right, that's good. But if you have it and it's wrong, right, I mean, we are asking how mankind came from the era of religion and mythical worldviews to science. And if they use this background knowledge, then this background knowledge will lead them astray. So the, the importance of this method is that they, work, that they can, correct, can correct uh, wrong background knowledge and they work independently from background knowledge. All what they assume is that the concepts in the laws are somehow independently observable. So, or the theory which is needed for the measurement can be taken as granted. That would be as granted. Sorry, that the, the measurement theory can be taken as granted. That would be then some kind of background knowledge. Uh, if that cannot be taken as granted, then we are in the domain of theory testing, in the domain of holism. Next block, part four of the lecture, uh, of, of the course. But as I said, uh, of course, if you, ha if you can rely on your background knowledge, it's good. But on the other hand, you always have to be critical. And if you, if you cannot rely on background knowledge, these methods also work without. Of course, slower without background knowledge, clearly, slower. And as you said, when you vary factors, I mean, you, you always make a selection, that's clear. You do the best what you can. But, um, yeah, yes? I think the background knowledge can be... Uh important in uh, finding a hypothesis that this method allows for them testing the hypothesis yeah. independent of the background knowledge. Yeah. Right? So, but I think, I think your point was, you know, you could uh, formulate all kinds of hypotheses and test them. Most of them probably turn out to be wrong, but you'd be busy testing quite a lot of hypotheses before you right. find one that, that is correct. But if you have some background knowledge, it's more likely that you immediately find the right hypothesis, which you can still test afterwards. i give you an example. <clears throat> Assume I have an allergy, or you, maybe some of you have, does really have an allergy. You want to find out what are the causes. There's a lot of background knowledge. Uh, there are 
It's, it's natural medicine. There are some wild hypotheses, like it's maybe what, what's, it's, a, it's maybe the radiation of, 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 of or the electricity of, of the uh, of the masters of the wires or telef telephone. Uh, uh, what is the English word for that? Yeah, telephone wires or so on. I mean, it, or it, it's just the, the, the food is generally poisoned. As some echo freak says, I mean, uh, you, you don't really know. Apply the method of experiment. So, what do you do? Uh, you, you live, say, in Düsseldorf, in your flat, in the city. You want to find out why you have these allergies. So, so someone might say, well, I try it out. I go now to a totally different place. At the same time, a totally different kind of food. I, I make sports instead of working. I live in a do di a d uh, have different clothes and change all factors at the same time. That would be not the experimental method. Because then, if something changes, you don't know what was the reason. To find it out, do it point by point, vary the factors which, of course, you have some common sense background knowledge, which could be causes. So first, vary your diet. It could be that a certain kind of food is responsible. Maybe you shouldn't eat oranges. So I know the sister of, of, of my wife has this, this allergy against oranges. right? So s certain doctors help you to find out whether a certain kind of food is responsible for allergy. If not, maybe the, the, the poles of the trees, there may be the poles of certain trees of certain flowers, so only then try that out, change that. Maybe it's this. Or maybe it's uh, dust in the house. When you change your, your flat, your, your living place, you change your house where you live, live in a tent for a while or whatever, or in a different house, but else, change nothing. And in that way, you can find out the cause of your allergy until you hit about on a factor which really changes changes the symptoms of allergy. That is the experimental method and you, you can apply that without any you know theories about the the most significant causes of allergy. This is what I mean. And this is also a practically useful method. Good. So so far the method of agreement and difference for strict laws, and now I turn to statistical laws. There was a further question. Yeah, um, I think maybe uh, the placebo effect is also relevant here because uh, if you test uh, some medication, you always give a placebo medication to the control group uh, because you know this might be a relevant factor, and you want to test if it, if there's some effect independent of this placebo effect. Right, so you want to see if if the ingredient that you think that you want to test is yeah, yeah, no, but the uh, uh, I speak about placebo effects uh, maybe later on. Maybe you repeat this question when when we have finished the testing for statistical laws, because then I give you a, a list of examples where you uh, of, of mistakes that can happen in the test of statistical laws. But concerning my example now, concerning the allergies, where you make a kind of self-test, right? Of course, you can yourself control the placebo effect. You just, uh, I mean, placebo effect only uh, happens if you believe, strongly believe, that a certain action will have an effect. Then the, the, the mere belief, that the hope and the belief that the action will have a positive effect on you, maybe... Uh, uh, produces this effect to some extent. This is a placebo effect, right? But in my example, you don't believe it, so there is no placebo effect, right? If you're critically... But the placebo effect is given if, a, if you have sleeping problems and the doctor gives you a sleeping pill, right? And you believe the sleeping pill helps you. This makes you so calm before you get sleep and so confident that then you really can sleep, right? Just this different mental attitude. That would be a placebo effect the sleeping pills. And you can, in that case you control for the placebo effect by just giving half of the group, the experimental group, you give true placebo pills, uh, you give true sleeping pills to the experimental group and you give so-called placebo pills to, to the control group. But they don't know that these pills are not effective and you can check for the difference. This is called a double blind test as you, as you call it also. No one knows which other effective pills, which are the placebo pills, only the, 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 the only experimenter knows it. But not the people who are doing the experiment, nor the, the test persons know it, just the experimenter knows it. So now I have already uh, uh, went some steps forward and ex explained to you the placebo effect. 
But as I said, I will speak about that uh, next lecture too. So let me now start finally the section on testing statistical laws. So far, you know, we have tested strict or deterministic laws. And if we test statistical laws, there are significant differences. Of course, there are common things, but there are also differences. The following ones. So let's go here. Um, okay. Um, first of all, in the statistical case, um, there are numbers. So you will see there is no strict falsification. There, there is confirmation and, uh, and this confirmation becomes something gradual. Secondly, um, as you will see, um, um, in the statistic, statistical case, the relevance of a law can be tested independently from its truth. Right? You will see why that is the case. And thirdly, the notion of representativity in the statistical case is a little bit more, maybe not only a little bit more, it's more complicated. So you, here you don't only require that the remainder factors, which are not in the antecedent, are maximally varied in the sense of as good as you can. But you should, uh, you should uh, actually, what, what you take, you, you should take something like random samples. So what you want is that the factors which are not mentioned in the antecedent are distributed in your sample in a similar way as they are distributed in the population. I will speak about that in more detail later. This is just a summary of the differences. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the point is this. <clears throat> Let's speak about the law. 80% of all trees beside motorways are sick. Being a tree beside a motorway is an antecedent factor, we just have one, and C being sick is a consequent factor, a criterion variable. Let us assume that A and C are sufficiently operationalized. So, so A are all trees, say, in Central Europe between 2010 and 2015, and uh, uh, say C being sick is operationalized in a clear way. So, if they are uh, leaf trees with leaves, then the, the density of the leaves is, is, is such and such, so they have less leaves than normal. Maybe the bark of the tree has certain defects. Maybe a, there are some beetles on the barks that may also be a kind of defect. So you measure that on, on a certain scale and, 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 and then project it on the binary scale, being sick to a certain degree or not. Okay, so we have this law. How do you test it? Well, you take a sample of trees beside motorways, and I said a representative sample, so it should be a sample of trees, which not all of the trees should be in Düsseldorf, right? I mean, some trees should be in Germany, some trees should be in other nations, like in Norway. Some trees should be in urban areas, some trees should be in rural areas, some trees should maybe be close to factories where there are possible other causes. Some trees should be far away. So just a, the easiest way of a representative sample is, a, is what you call a random sample. You draw these trees somehow <laughs> randomly from the population of all trees. Of course, it cannot be literally be done, right? I mean, but you can somehow approximate it practically. Just try as good as you can. Spe uh, speak about that in more, in more detail later on. Okay. Now assume you take samples with 100 trees. 100 trees. Okay. So, first we test for truth of this method. And the test for truth in statistics is also called the method of acceptance and confidence intervals. And it's a version of the method of agreement of John Stuart Mill. So, let me explain. Assume you take an A sample, 100 trees, and you found you find 75 Cs. 75 of 100 A's are Cs. Is this a confirmation or a rejection of the law? 80% of all A's are Cs. This is a question. What would you say? I mean, intuitively. Does, it, does the sample result confirm the law or not? So first of all, if this deviation of 5, not, 70, not 80 but 75, 
is this sufficient to reject the law or not? Why not? Because the sample isn't big enough, so it could be yes. due to chance. Exactly. So, so exactly. So the point now is this. We are drawing a random sample. So out of the total population of trees where we, where we the, the, the claim is that we have 80% of sick, uh, sick, out of the total population of trees beside motorways, right? Where the claim is asserted that 80% of them are sick. We have taken a sample randomly of 175 were sick. Of course, random samples will always deviate in their frequency from the population frequency. So the sample frequency will of course deviate from the population frequency. You know, you know that from tossing coins, right? Uh, I mean, the chance of landing on heads is one half, but if you toss it, uh, a coin ten times, you are not really surprised if there are seven times head. Well, sometimes it happens, right? But if you go on, if you toss it hundred times, well, then the question is, are you surprised if you have seventy times heads? Well, yeah, you are. At least much more than for ten tosses. But, but still there will be a deviation. The deviation this is also called the law of large numbers. The deviation will become smaller when the sample increases. I'll tell you soon more about that. But there will be a certain deviation. So now the, really the question is, is a certain calculation. And the calculation now um, in, in the standard statistical methodology is the following method of acceptance interval. This goes back to Fisher, the famous paper of the statistician Fisher 1956. Um, it goes as follows. First, you choose a so-called acceptance coefficient. The acceptance coefficient, which is usually taken, is 95%. And then, from the sample size <coughs> and the co acceptance coefficient, you calculate the so-called confidence interval. In our case, the conf uh, sorry, the so-called acceptance interval. Sorry. The acceptance interval for the hypothesis. In our case, the acceptance interval is between 72 and 80, 88 um, C's out of 100 A's. This is the acceptance interval for the sample frequency in a 100 sample. Um, now, if the sample frequency lies within the acceptance interval, the hypothesis is still accepted. It's not rejected. And if the sample frequency lies without the acceptance interval, the hypothesis is rejected. What is the rationale behind that? The rationale is that this acceptance interval is exactly that, that interval of sample frequencies which you will expect with a probability of 95%. Given the hypothesis is true, right? So given the hypothesis is true, the 95% of all random samples of 100 A's will have the frequency of six trees between 72 and 88. And so you say, you assume the law to be tested has already some confirmation. This is also, also called test statistics, right? So assume so another scientist has set up that law and a second group of scientists or two and you are now a group who are controlling whether this is really really true. So you say if this sample result lies within this interval of 95% of, 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 of most probable frequencies and sample frequency which are to be accepted with 95% then, uh, then I uh, have no reason to reject the law hypothesis, but if the sample frequency lies outside of that interval, I reject it. This is the method. Um, so let me go here to the next slide, which tells you this in more in, in, in detail. The acceptance interval is that centrosomatic interval of the most probable sample frequencies in which the sample frequency is located with a probability which equals the acceptance coefficient, in our case 95%, right? Given the law hypothesis being tested is true, 
And here you see the corresponding uh, here you see the corresponding um, figure. So here, here it is. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it's a bit, bit difficult here. Whoops. So on the x-axis you see the absolute frequencies of C's in 100 A's, right? Ranging from 0 to 100. And we assume that the population law is true, that there are 80% C's in the, in the population of A's. And you see that the, the, here on the y-axis you see the, see the probability of the sample frequencies, given the hypothesis is true. And you see that the most probable sample frequencies are, of course, that which coincide with the population frequency, namely 80%. So here the curve has a peak. But the probability of the sample frequencies goes down the more you go away from the true population frequency, right? So you get this curve. Um, so the curve, this curve. Um, approximates zero for population frequencies, for sample frequencies which are far away from the population frequencies. So for 60 of value, 40, it's almost zero. But it's only almost zero. It's not exactly, it's not really zero here, right? So there is also a chance to draw by random a, a sample of 100 trees where only 40 are sick, if in the population 80 are sick. The chance is very little, so but it's not really zero. Okay. So if you look at the curve, the area under the curve is the probability of samples having uh, frequencies in this interval. Right? The area under the total curve is just 100% of 1, probability of 100%. The acceptance interval is just that area of 95% of most probable uh, sample frequencies. The gray um, um, zone here is the acceptance interval. So the, the interval from 72 to 88, that is the acceptance interval. And the gray zone under the curve, this is the probability uh, of frequencies lying in that, uh, of sample frequencies lying in that acceptance interval. And it is exactly 95% of the total probability. And the rejection interval are these uh, white zones under the curve. 2.5% here and 2.5% here in total 5%. So 5% of the total area is the white zone. And this is a rejection interval. So here the definition, the acceptance interval is a central symmetrical interval of the most probable sample frequencies. They are most probable because they are highest here, right? In which the sample frequency is located with a probability equal to the acceptance coefficient under the assumption that the law hypothesis being tested is true. This is the idea. And um, so if you apply the method of acceptance interval, you do the following. You ask, is the A sample frequency of C within the acceptance interval? If no, then the law is strongly disconfirmed because then the actual, the, the, uh, the experimental result which you really did get had a probability of 5% or less, right? It lied out of this 95% zone. So if, if um, the actual observations, your actual evidence is made very improbable by your hypothesis, then the hypothesis is very improbable given the evidence, right? But I should say that, well, i say that later. While if your experimental result is within the acceptance interval, you say, well, the law is still weakly confirmed. The reason is not sufficiently strong to reject the law hypothesis because I assume the law hypothesis has already been confirmed uh, elsewhere and uh, I'm in a situation of a test statistics. But I speak of weak confirmation here 
Well, let's speak about our example. In our example, obviously, 75, that was our uh, uh, observed result, lies within the acceptance interval of se between 72 and 88. So we don't reject the, the uh, law about 80% secretaries on, on, on motorways. So in our result, the answer is yes. Um, Why do I speak of weak confirmation here? Um, thank you. Well, you know, look again at that curve here. So our actual result was here, right? Where now the cursor is. Yeah? That was the observed sample frequency. So. This result lies in the acceptance interval of the hypothesis of 80%. But of course, it would also lie in the acceptance interval of the hypothesis of 79%, 78%, 77%, 81%, 82%, and so on. So all, all hypotheses for which the observed result lies in the acceptance interval would be acceptable. right? So now statisticians had the idea to call this interval of hypotheses for which the observed result lies in the acceptance interval. They call this interval the confidence interval. So the confidence interval is gotten as follows. But here now you are, so to speak, in the situation of inference, what is called inference statistics, where you don't test a particular hypothesis, where just, but you just have an observation, a sample frequency, and you, uh, you are asking what are the most probable population laws. Uh, um, given this sample frequency. And this is a method of confidence interval. So here you have now your observed result of 75 six trees, and now you draw the acceptance interval bounds around the observed result, right? And what you get here is a confidence interval of population hypothesis. It goes now from, you again, draw eight, eight of, out of 100 uh, to the minus and 8 out of 100 to the plus, but now around the observed value of 75, you get the confidence interval from 67 to 83. This is the interval of population hypothesis, which are accepted by the evidence of 75 out of 100. Right? This is called the confidence interval. And the confidence interval, that is the law which is strongly confirmed. What is strongly confirmed is the confidence interval law which for the given sample result says the percentage of C's among A's is between 67% and 83%. So between 67 and 83% of trees beside motorways are sick. This is a confidence interval law and this is strongly confirmed. It consists of the disjunction of all law hypotheses which are accepted by the experimental result. So, so far for today, and I will continue with explaining to you the method of statistical tests next lecture. Thank you.